Thank you for joining us for another lesson from God's Word. The Streetsboro Church of Christ is located at 1386 Russell Drive, Streetsboro, Ohio, 44241. If you're ever in the area, we hope that you'll stop in and worship with us. We hope that you'll enjoy this lesson brought to you by our minister, Ralph Price. We began a lesson last week on the topic of Jesus is, a study of the many roles that Jesus plays in our lives. And we noticed 11 different terms that are used to describe Jesus uh, in the scriptures. And we went through those and, and talked a little bit about what those roles mean for us. And today we're going to hit 11 more uh, terms. And as I was uh, thinking about this, there are even more. We might extend this one uh, out another week and think about some more of the, of the names that are applied to Jesus and, uh, and what those names mean for us. We're going to dive right in again since it's an 11-point sermon. We better get going uh, and hit the first one here. Jesus is also described by the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 1 as our hope. Our hope. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. Our hope, the word hope, you know, I've given you my definition of it many times. It's a desire and an expectation. Not merely a desire or wanting something, that's a wish. A hope is wishing for something, but also knowing that one day we're going to receive it. And certainly as we think about Jesus, uh, he makes our hope possible. What is our hope? Well, our hope is heaven. Our hope is eternal life. And he is the one that gives us the ability to have that expectation. We need not just wish and for salvation. We can expect it through Christ and his sacrifice. As our hope, we need to lay hold of that hope that is set before us. Hebrews 6, 18 through 20, the Hebrew writer tells us, by, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. A couple things there that we want to notice about hope. Um, first of all, this hope we are to set before us and we are to lay hold of that hope. In other words, yeah, we may have a desire and an expectation of heaven, but we have to lay hold of that hope. There is something required of you and I in order to be able to have that hope uh, of eternal life. And this hope is also described as an anchor of the soul. And we think about the function of an anchor. An anchor is, is a device that holds a ship in place. Uh, and when the waves begin to beat against that ship and the wind blows, that ship, if the anchor holds, will remain fast. And so the anchor of our soul is, is our hope of heaven. And in the storms of life and with the the storms that the devil throws against us and the temptations that we face, that hope is always an anchor to hold us in place, hold us on the right path uh, to salvation. So Jesus is described as our hope. He makes our hope possible. He's also described as our peace. Now, in Ephesians 2 and verse 14, Paul says, He himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Now, when Jesus here is described as our peace, this context in Ephesians chapter 2 is looking at the law of Moses and the distinction it made between Jew and Gentile. And Paul describes that law of Moses as a middle wall of separation. It made a distinction between Jew and Gentile. But here he says Jesus is our peace. He's made peace between the Jew and the Gentile. And he has made both one. He has brought us together in one body, thus making peace. So between Jew and Gentile, there is now peace. And Jesus is the one who makes that possible. 
we can, of course, extend that to not just Jew and Gentile, but when we think about all of our relations with our fellow man, uh, Christ makes peace possible, and he shows us how to be at peace uh, with our fellow man. Now, as such, also, we need to seek to have and enjoy that peace. And one of the aspects of the peace that Jesus offers, Romans 5 and verse 1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He makes peace possible with our fellow man between Jew and Gentile, but also, even more importantly, he makes it possible for us to be at peace with God. That's because he himself has appeased the wrath. And there's another term we could talk about. He's described as propitiation. And we'll do that more and more I think about it. We are going to have a third lesson on the terms used to describe Christ. He's also described as our Savior. Now in this passage, John 14, 14, the word Savior is not used, but it certainly is implied. Jesus in this context is having a discussion with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, and he says, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall become in him a fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life. He offers everlasting life. He gives us that water which will quench our thirst and will never thirst again. He's not talking about the physical water. He draws a, con a contrast in this context and says, the ones who drink this water will thirst again, but the ones who drink the water that I shall give shall never thirst again. He's talking about his, his teaching, his doctrine, and the salvation that he offers. He is our Savior. As such, we need to come to him. We talk about the Lord's invitation in Matthew 11, 28 to 30, and he offers an invitation for all to come to him. He is our Savior, but we have to come to him. We have to uh, obey his will. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We could do a series of lessons on just that passage right there. But notice Jesus says we do have a responsibility to come to him. He is the Savior of the world. He is our hope. He is our peace. But we have to come to Him in order to enjoy those blessings. He says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden. I think those terms labor and are heavy laden applies to all humanity, doesn't it? In one sense, we all labor and we all are heavy laden with the burdens and cares of this life. So the invitation is for all. He's our Savior. We have to come to Him. Peter describes Jesus as an example for us. He says in 1 Peter 2 and verse 21, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Now the context there in 1 Peter 2 is Peter is pointing out that Christians are going to suffer, that there is going to be suffering. And he says that's the example that Jesus gave to us. It's silly for a person to think that if they become a Christian, they're going to be exempt from any type of problem or suffering in this life. Because when we look to our ultimate example, Jesus, certainly he had to endure suffering in this life. And the suffering that he endured far outweighs anything that you and I uh, will have to endure. So he is our example in suffering, but certainly it's safe to say he really is our example in all things. And as such, we, we need to follow what Paul told the Corinthians there. He's told them to imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. So in other words, we ought to imitate the qualities of Christ that we see in others and use those as an example. We've talked recently on Wednesday evenings in the invitations about a role model and how we often look up to role models and try to emulate them in our lives and that Christ is really the ultimate role model and should be for each and every one of us. So he is our example in all things, not just in suffering, but in how we ought to conduct our lives. Passage which was read for us, Jesus describes in John 10, verses 10 and 11, he describes himself as the good shepherd. 
He contrasts himself to the thief which comes in to steal and to kill. The thief being one who has no concern for the sheep but only concern for himself. Whereas Jesus, the good shepherd, he gives his life for the sheep. His concern, his care is for the sheep. And he is willing even to give his, very, his own life for the sheep. And we know ultimately that Jesus did that. That he did give his life for his sheep. But as our shepherd then, as shepherd, I like to say, had three primary functions. He was to lead, he was to provide, and he was to protect his sheep. Now, as the sheep then, it is our responsibility to hear and follow. We have to hear our shepherd, and we have to be willing to follow. In John 10, 27 and 28, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. An interesting fact, many of you probably know this, is uh, the way the sheepfolds worked back then, there would be one sheepfold and there would be numerous flocks uh, in that one enclosure. And the shepherd could then come to that sheepfold and just by calling his sheep, his sheep would know his voice and his sheep would come out and separate themselves from the rest of the, the sheep that were there in that enclosure. When Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me, the implication there, the point he's trying to get across, is that we as his shepherd must know his voice. He doesn't speak to us audibly today, but what he does do is he speaks to us through his word. And when we know him and we know about him and know his will, then we hear him and we follow his teachings. And as we follow his teachings, as we continue to hear and follow, the promise is there that we'll never perish. And nobody can snatch us out of his hand. As long as we continue to hear and follow, we will never perish. We will never lose our salvation. Nobody can force us. We can choose to not follow the shepherd. We can choose to quit following him. But as long as we make the effort and, and strive to follow him, our salvation is promised, is guaranteed as long as we continue in that. Jesus is also described as a prophet in Acts 3 and 22. Not just a prophet, but the prophet. In Acts 3, 22, Peter says, For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. Now this looks back to Old Testament prophecy. And the Jews had many prophets throughout history, but they also had the prophet. The prophet is looking back to this prophecy from Deuteronomy chapter 18, actually, um, that foretold that God was going to send a prophet. And you might remember that on different occasions, Jesus was asked, and John the Baptist was asked, are you the prophet? Now, not just are you a prophet, but are you the prophet? They were asking, are you, are you the prophet that was promised to Moses that uh, you know, God was going to send another prophet like him among his brethren. The answer was, yes, Jesus was that prophet. What is a prophet? A prophet is, is basically a spokesman for God, a mouthpiece for God himself. And Jesus fulfilled that role, obviously, during his ministry here. As such, Acts 3.23, we better listen. We better hear him. It says, and it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Again, that was part of the prophecy back in Deuteronomy, and it is applied here to Jesus. He is the prophet. If you have any Muslim friends, okay, Muslim uh, individuals look at Deuteronomy 18 and say that's Muhammad. Uh, the prophet is Muhammad. But here we have in Acts chapter 3, the prophet identified for us in Scripture. It's not Muhammad. It's Jesus is the prophet whom we must hear uh, in order to have eternal life. Implication being also, hear no others. Do not suffer to hear anyone else who teaches anything other than what the prophet teaches. He's also our priest, Hebrews 3 and verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. 
He's described numerous times in the book of Hebrews as our high priest. So he's a prophet and he's a priest. Okay, a prophet was a spokesman. What was a priest? Well, a prophet was a spokesman for God to the people. And it, it's been said that a priest kind of reversed that. A priest was one who spoke to God for the people. Okay, and so that is kind of the role here that a priest played. And Jesus is described as our high priest. And as such, we can turn to him for help and for consolation. Hebrews 4. Beginning in verse 14, the Hebrew writer says, Seeing then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy to, and find grace to help in time of need. Now Jesus was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. That little phrase, yet without sin, is so important uh, in regard to Jesus. If he had ever had one sinful thought or committed one sin, then you and I would all be lost. All humanity would be lost because, you see, Jesus had to remain sinless in order to be the sacrifice for sin. But this tells us, though, that he can sympathize with our weaknesses. Why is that? Well, he lived as one of us. He lived as a human being. He can sympathize with us. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what it's like to be scared, to be hungry, to, to you know, the experience of being a human being. And we can then rest assured that he has compassion on us and he understands what it is that we're enduring. So we can boldly come to the, come to the throne of grace and find grace to help in time of need. So he is our prophet, he's our priest, and he's also our king. John 18 and verse 37, Pilate asked Jesus, Are you a king then? And Jesus said, You said rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said, Are you a king? He said, Yeah, you're right, I'm a king. Now, um, I'm sure Pilate, man, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus says, yes, I'm a king, but I'm, I'm going to suggest to you, at least in Jesus' mind, he wasn't just the king of the Jews. And he is not just the king of the Jews. He's the king of humanity, of all mankind. He has authority over all of us. As our king, then, we have to serve him. We have to obey his will just as we would a, an earthly king. In Matthew 25, 34 to 36, we have a, a resurrection um, parable here uh, about those who help those who are in need. And Jesus is the king in this parable who has come back to judge. And the king says to those on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. I said as our king, we have to serve him. Here in this judgment scene, he says, I was hungry, you gave me food. Thirsty, you gave me drink. In that big long list, what's he saying there? You were obedient. Obedient in what sense? Well, Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so in this judgment scene, he's saying that those who heed that, those who do what I have commanded them to do, will then hear those wonderful words, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the, from the foundation of the world. What we're seeing here as we look at all of these things about Christ is it also tells us a little bit about something about what's required of us. If he's our prophet, we have to hear him. If he's our priest, we can turn to him for help. If he's our king, again, we've got to serve him and do his will. He's also described in scripture numerous times as Lord. Most times in the New Testament, when you see the word Lord, it's a reference to Christ. Not always, but most of the time. In Acts 2, in verse 36, in his conclusion in his sermon on the day of Pentecost, Peter says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. What does the word Lord mean? 
simplest definition is master. He's our master. And as our Lord then, we must bow to him. Okay, if he's our master. And again, bowing to him is uh, synonymous with obeying his will and doing his will. In Philippians 2, 10 and 11, Paul wrote at the, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's our Lord. He's our Master. Therefore bow the knee to Him and render unto Him the obedience that He so richly deserves. Hebrew writer describes Jesus <coughs> excuse me, as the captain of our salvation in Hebrews 2 and verse 10. For it is fitting for him for whom, from whom, excuse me, for whom all things uh, and by whom all things are all. Let me start over. <laughs> for it is fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. The idea of a captain, you look up the word captain there, and it means a leader, a leader. He is the one who leads us to salvation. He is the one who then makes our salvation possible. A captain is one to be feared and one who is to be obeyed. When you think about a captain on a ship, uh, he is to be feared and obeyed. And a captain, you know, they, they, they're never supposed to express any doubt or uncertainty as they're making their decisions but and a lot of times captains have to put on a, a show and, and they really are uncertain but they can't appear that way but certainly with Jesus um, all of those qualities apply to Jesus that he is a leader and he is fearless in a sense that you know he'll do whatever it takes and he he demonstrated that on the cross again so then as our captain let's obey him we must obey him in um, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9, in reference to Jesus, it says he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. We could use that word author actually as another point. The word author there, it means the, the originator, the one who made it possible. As such, he is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Okay, we can't leave off those last three words, who obey him. Um, yes, he's, he brings salvation to mankind, but only those who obey him will enjoy that salvation. Finally, he's also described in scripture as our mediator. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. A mediator is one who <clears throat> is a go-between. Um, when you have two parties, or I don't know, maybe even more than two parties that are in conflict. A mediator is an uh, impartial third party that comes in and helps to mediate or negotiate or helps to resolve the conflict between those parties. And Jesus is our mediator. As such, then, we, we ought to use him. And I, I have John 16, 23 one of the ways that he mediates for us is um, he's, we go to God through him in prayer. We don't pray directly to Jesus. We pray to the Father through Jesus. That's one of, the, one of the ways that he mediates. He said there in John 16, 23, In that day you will ask me nothing, most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. So that's one example of how he mediates. But certainly... The main way in which he mediates is that, again, you have two parties that were in conflict, God and man. And he made peace possible, which goes back to point number two. He, he makes the peace possible between God and man. So we have these 11 points. He's our hope. He's our peace, our savior, our example, our shepherd, our prophet, priest, and king, our Lord, our captain, and our mediator. You look back to last week, he's, our, he's God's son, he's God's gift, he's the foundation of all that we believe, he's the light, he's the way, the truth, and the life, the door, the bread of life, our great physician, and our friend. The question then that we want to ask is, what is he to you, as we're concluding? And I want to suggest to you that even if 
He is none of these things to you. Maybe you're not a believer. Uh, maybe he's none of those things. Please understand that one day he will be your judge. Whether you believe in him or not. He made that promise uh, for us in John 12 and 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him at the last day. The word that I have spoken will judge him. And 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 here tells us we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That each one may receive the thing done, things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So what is he to you? Well, one day he's going to be your judge. He's going to be my judge. Therefore, as we think back to everything we have discussed, are you obeying that prophet? Are you hearing the words of the prophet and obeying and serving the king and the Lord of your life? If not, we offer you an opportunity right now to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you do believe in him, then why won't you please repent or turn from your sins, confess your faith in him, and then be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. But only do that if you're willing to make the commitment to faithfully serve him on a daily basis. If you've already done that, but since become unfaithful, again, I said, you know, as long as we hear and follow him, no one can snatch us out of his hand, but sometimes we can wander. Uh, we can choose not to follow him, even after we've obeyed. If, if that describes you, then, then the answer is repent. Turn back and follow Christ again and ask his forgiveness and, and God will give that forgiveness. So if you are never have obeyed the gospel, we invite you to come and we can baptize you today. If you've already obeyed the gospel but have since become unfaithful, please come and repent of the sin in your life. Or if there's any other need we can help with, we encourage you to come as we stand and sing. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, Ralph can be reached at rprice at streetsboroughchurch.org or by calling 330-626-4282. If you would like to learn more about the Church of Christ, we offer free Bible correspondence courses by mail and home Bible studies. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Feel free to come visit us. We would love to have the opportunity to meet you.